Welcome to Stories After Midnight. Today I've got a special story for you. It's called The Procedure by Jarrett. It's a viewer submitted story and so if you're listening to this, I really appreciate you sending this in. If you'd like to send in your story, head over to storiesaftermidnight.com. And thank you to my patrons for helping make this episode possible. Let's get started. Ever since I could remember, I've always been a bit of a hypochondriac. As a child, I'd drive my mother crazy the amount of times I begged her to take me to the doctor. It's funny, really. I've always been somewhat apprehensive of the doctor's office, yet it never overrode my desire for peace of mind. So when I started to get strange headaches a few weeks ago, I immediately set up an urgent care visit. I was convinced I had a tumor in my head or some other strange, rare, incurable disease. I searched Google endlessly, each search result saying I had an ailment worse than the last. Sweat beaded down my brow, my chest tightened as anxiety coursed through my body. I fidgeted uncomfortably, unable to rid my mind of the thought that a brain tumor was growing larger inside my skull with each passing second. Or maybe a swollen blood vessel that was going to rupture, causing a fatal aneurysm. My urgent care visit was unconvincing. The doctor told me that it was indeed normal for a healthy adult in her mid-twenties to get headaches. But I, of course, needed reassurance. Finally, after pestering and badgering and even flat-out arguing, she conceded and scheduled me for an MRI appointment. Finally, after several weeks of worrying, I arrived for my MRI at St. John's General Hospital. The waiting room I arrived in was a small rectangle. The administrative desk was in the front of the room, where two receptionists sat looking irritated, busy on phone calls. A purple orchid in a pot sat at the corner of the desk. An aquarium tank was embedded in the wall behind the orchid. Fluorescent greens and blues bloomed and highlighted the tropical fish that swam around the tank's interior. The air conditioning hummed over the sound of Good Morning America being played softly through the TV mounted in the corner of the ceiling. Stationed in this waiting room were 15 identical, expensive-looking, shiny black leather chairs that had button tufting going up the backrests. Five chairs were occupied with patients. An elderly man and his presumed wife, a middle-aged, balding man with freckles, and a mother, maybe in her late forties, seated next to her teenage daughter. I checked in, arranged my insurance, and sat down in the waiting room. I pulled out my phone as I settled into the cold, firm leather seat cushion of one of the chairs. All of the other patients were getting called before me. I noticed that, strangely, none of the other people in the room were on their phones. They were either conversing amongst themselves, or perhaps, most bizarrely, reading magazines the hospital had provided. Within 15 minutes, the room was empty except for me. The hum of the AC left me uneasy. Effectively having tuned out the television above me, the room was quiet. Then finally a door opened to my left. I shifted in my seat to face a masked nurse. Her sky-blue scrubs were covered in dark crimson splatters which were splayed out in random, irregular patterns. The stains were faint and subtle, yet still deeply contrasted by the light blue color of the scrubs. It's hard to explain, even now, and I still rack my brain trying to find a good way to describe it, yet seem to fail. At the sight of the nurse, I reflexively tucked my knees to my chin in fear and confusion. The wooden legs of my chair slid audibly against the carpeted floor. The nurse made eye contact with me behind her mask, yet did not speak to me. She strolled past me to the desk, whispered something to the receptionist, looked back towards me, and then exited the waiting room in the same door she entered. The receptionist spoke my name, asking me to come to her. I rose from my seat, still the only patient in the room. There has been an unfortunate malfunction with our MRI imager. We could reschedule, but the waiting list is two months, she said to me, her wrinkled eyes emotionless and drained. How the hell does an MRI machine malfunction? W well, wouldn't I go to the top of the list? I've already waited a month, I protested. No, ma'am. I'm afraid that's not how our waiting list operates. All of our other locations are booked as well, I'm afraid. Oh, well, that's just great, I muttered, frustrated. I slung my purse over my shoulder as I turned to exit the waiting room. There is an alternative, ma'am. And what would that be? I said, my hand still on the door handle. A cerebral angiogram, she said bluntly, as if expecting me to know what that was. What's that? I questioned. I walked towards the desk. 
It's a simple procedure. I waited for a follow-up that never came. Just a blank stare. Discomfort roiled in the nape of my neck. Okay, but what is it? I pressed. It's a medical procedure that takes images of the blood vessels inside of your brain. Looking here, your insurance fully covers it. I was relieved. I couldn't really afford an MRI bill anyway, so if I could have gotten out of there without having to spend a penny, it would have helped with the bills immensely. Little did I know at the time that the two procedures were entirely separate and used for vastly different medical reasons. But you can do this now? Yes, ma'am. Shall I tell them you're ready? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah I guess so. I said anxiously. The procedure sounded legitimate. Great, just sign this form. A form with the hospital's logo as a header was pushed in front of me. What is this? Just some legal jargon. You know how it is. The receptionist chuckled, the first sign of emotion in her voice. I grabbed the pen and scrawled my signature on the bottom line. A mistake. Great, you're all set. Immediately, almost as if she was listening from the other side of the door, the masked nurse and the blood-stained scrubs popped into the room. Mind you, I was still standing at the reception desk. Follow me, please, the nurse said, turning her back to me. How's your day? she asked. Oh, it's okay, I said, the small talk making me uneasy. I'm still not entirely sure what was said in the next few moments. At the time, I believed what I heard, muttered under her breath was, It won't be. Now I'm not entirely sure, but I know she said something that she didn't want me to hear. In any event, we continued until we reached one of the many general examination rooms. Have a seat. I did as instructed, perching myself delicately on the end of the exam bed. The paper that covered the bed crinkled under my petite frame. Okay, since we are doing an angiogram, I'm going to need a blood sample. Oh, why is that? I asked. Hated needles. Mainly we're checking for adequate levels of hemoglobin in your blood. Oh? Yes, it's to check for sepsis. We are also checking your PT levels to rule out any kind of coagulopathy. The medical terms flew over my head as she took my blood pressure and checked my heart with a stethoscope. All things that a nurse would do. Then she prepared my arm for the blood draw. I winced as the needle slid into my flesh, the pinch severe then tapering off. I felt my pulse as the blood was drawn out of my body. Finally, she withdrew the needle, bandaged the spot on my arm, then exited the room. Wait here, I'll return with your test results. Strange. Any test I'd ever gotten usually takes days to weeks to get the results for. While waiting, I searched for the procedure briefly on Google, but I couldn't quite ascertain the spelling. Hell, why couldn't I remember? Blood test came back normal. I assume Dr. Bergman, our head radiologist, went through the procedure and any side effects you may have, answered your questions. The nurse burst back into the room, her masked face now making eye contact. No, I was alone the entire time. Oh, well, that's unfortunate. He was probably seeing another patient. I'll make sure he visits you and answers all of your questions beforehand. In the meantime, I'll need you to change into a hospital gown. I followed her to a changing room. The room was small and dimly lit with a single overhead bulb. Lockers lined each wall as I threw off my shirt, bra, jeans, and shoes. I slipped the massive hospital gown over my head. I met the nurse outside the door, who was now surrounded with four other nurses, two at each side, to lead me to the procedure room. I followed them closely, rounding corners and walking down long hallways. I didn't see any other patients or any other staff members. My chest felt heavy. I still haven't talked to any doctors yet. I have some concerns, I said aloud. Just then, we rounded the corner into a massive room. Numerous, unfamiliar instruments were strung about. Large, cylindrical drums were suspended from the ceiling. Futuristic-looking computers were sprawled across the room. A man, maybe late thirties, stood in the middle of the room, his heavy black beard raised as he smiled warmly, his white lab coat pristine. Hello, I'm Dr. Bergman. I'm so very sorry I wasn't able to see you earlier. I was preoccupied with another patient. Please, do lie down on that gurney and we'll get started. Wait, I have questions. I spoke up having enough of the verbal hot potato. Such as, he said impatiently. What goes on during this exactly? Like, exactly, exactly. I froze, unmoving, distrust seeping through my pores. It's a cerebral angiogram. It's 
It's used primarily to detect any abnormalities in the brain or its blood supply. I didn't ask what it does. I asked what the procedure is like, what happens during it. I said, my heart racing. Patient is being belligerent. Strap her down. The doctor yelled suddenly. Nurses on either side grabbed me underneath my arms. I kicked and screamed. Let go of me! Hell, let go of me! Another nurse bent over and grabbed my ankles. The rubbery latex gloves were harsh on my exposed skin. I struggled, bucked and wiggled ferociously, trying to pry myself free. I turned my head out of desperation and bit down on one of the nurse's shoulders. She gasped as her grip loosened. My shoulder and back slammed down forcefully on the shiny floor. I kicked and flopped around and screamed, hoping to pry myself free. More nurses and doctors now, all of them with enraged sneers drawn across their faces. They grabbed at me, a sea of hands all gripping a part of me as resistance became futile. Help me! Help me! I continued to scream until my vocal cords gave out. Dry, silent gasps emanated from my mouth as the cocoon of insane medical staff lifted my crazed, convulsing body into the gurney. Tie her down, Dr. Bergman shouted. I began weeping, sobbing even. My chest heaved, hopelessly dreading what was to come, even though I had no idea what that was. Gloved hands secured, buckled nylon straps around my hands, then legs. Around my wrists, then my arms. My waist, then my chest and head. I was completely immobilized. I tried turning my head to get a full view of my surroundings. I was only able to move my eyes as masked people scuffled about the room. Bright overhead lights burned into my corneas as Dr. Bergman walked over to me, standing right above my head. Biting my assistant wasn't very nice, now was it? He growled, his eyes full of hate and disdain. Let me go, I managed to squeak out, my throat still raw and dry. The doctor scoffed as he turned away. Sedator, a paralyzing agent would be best, he demanded. An IV bag was strung on a hook as a long needle was slid into the crook of my elbow. Then drugs were administered into the tube after a saline flush. I began to lose feeling in my entire body. I was conscious, but could not feel from the neck down. Then strangely, a large metal thing was placed around my neck, and locked from both sides with large padlocks. It was a half-circle band that fit on top of my neck. In the middle of the band was a long, narrow cylinder that shot up a few inches, barely the width of a pencil lead. Then Dr. Bergman wheeled over on a stool, with a four-inch needle nestled in his hands. A tube ran from the needle. My head put two and two together, an ink injector. They were injecting ink into my brain through my throat. No, stop, I don't want this, I screamed, my vocal cords finding new strength. My screams were so loud that they echoed off of the walls. Surely someone would check on me. And the madness? This room is soundproof, just keep your throat still, it hurts less. Bergman smiled sadistically, relishing the moment. Finally, after a few tense seconds, he dipped the needle downwards, inserting it into the metal tube jutting out from my neck band. I braced myself. I felt the needle tip against my neck. My skin hunkered back reflexively. The tip pushed firmly against my skin. The pressure unbearable, then broke the surface. Pain shot through the newly made hole. Blood spurted out of the hole and onto my face in warm red droplets. I winced the needle slowly working its way through each individual membrane layer of my throat. I felt a sharp rod wiggle its way deeper into my flesh, the nerves in my neck constricting and screaming out in pain. The needle worked its way until it touched my windpipe. I couldn't speak, couldn't move. Breathing was laborious and strained, each inhale a sharp stab of agony. I saw blue ink begin to run through the line, then everything faded to black, my body finally giving up. I awoke in a recovery room, not sure of where I was, my eyes adjusted. An elderly looking nurse stood at a computer in the room. I felt my neck, a small circular bandage covered the needle hole. Finally awake, the nurse said. Where am I? My drug induced haze impairing my memory. The B wing of Madison Canyon Medical Center, how are you feeling? No, no, that can't be right. 
I thought I was at St. John's, I said, my memory suddenly coming back in a flash at the incorrect hospital name. I was confused. How could this be possible? I'm sorry, but that hospital was demolished 30 years ago. I I'm not quite sure what you're talking about. What procedure did you undergo? It says here that... An angiogram or something like that? I'm sorry. I'm not sure I heard you right. An angiogram, I said, emphasizing each syllable. Ma'am, we haven't done a procedure like that in this hospital since the mid-70s. That's the end of the story. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, let me know. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Huge thank you uh, to Jarrett for sending it in. I really do appreciate you for doing that. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to, there is a Discord you can come and hang out with us in. And uh, a Patreon if you'd like to support the channel even more than likes, subscribes, or comments. Although all those are appreciated. If you're listening on the podcast, I really don't know what your options are. But I do know Spotify lets you answer some Q&A questions. So I do read those. But anyway, without further ado, thank you for listening. We'll see you in the next one.